Amen.
praise you, Lord, and worship you. chapter 17 verse 1 it says now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia Apollonia how do you say it they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of Jews you see at this time Luke wasn't with them Luke obviously stayed back when you look at the last chapter verse 13 it says we because Luke's writing writing this 
It says we, and now he says they, so he obviously stayed behind. And they took this journey, which was about a three-day journey. It was about 100 miles. It was about 30 miles between each one of these cities. So it took about three days to get there. You know, when we read the Word a lot, we see one verse, and we don't realize three days went by, you know? Sometimes years went by. And it's good to know that sometimes. And the first thing that he does is he finds a synagogue to minister the Word of God to the Jew first. Paul had a calling to the Gentiles, but he also knew that it says, he says in Romans 1, 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also <clears throat> to the Greek. So when he came into a city, he went to the, find a synagogue, or wherever he could, and shared the gospel with, with those there. So here he is in the verse 2, it says, And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths, reason with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus who I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. Now, the Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is his title. He is the Messiah, the Christ, their Savior. And Paul is explaining to them from the scriptures. Now at that time, you know that they didn't have the New Testament. They had the Old Testament. So he would give them scriptures in the Old Testament to point out prophecies about Jesus. Because the Old Testament is loaded with prophecies about Jesus. The Old Testament is so relevant. There are people in my life that say, well, why do you teach out of the Old Testament? It is relevant for today. Yes, it is. Very relevant. Let me give you some scriptures that he might have shared with his Jewish friends here. Isaiah 53, verse 6 and 7. He could have shared this. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of all, all of us, to fall on him. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter. And like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. It was a picture of Jesus when he came, when they took him, and they crucified him. And then you have Psalm 22, verse 1 says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is what Jesus said on the cross. Down to verse 6, it says, But I am a worm and not a man, because Jesus had been so deformed by the sin that had come upon him, and by the beatings that he took, that he, he, was, he was a worm, he wasn't even a man. He reproached of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with lip. They wag the head saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. And those are the things that they said to him when Jesus was on the cross. Let him rescue him. Because he delights in him. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. It's the picture of a death on the cross. The crucifixion. So they could relate to this because they know how people die on the cross. And then he said in verse 15, My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me, a band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And it's just a picture of Jesus on the cross. And what happened to him? And he's reasoning with the people in the synagogue, these things. Psalm 16.10, he says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, Sheol nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Talking about a resurrection, coming out of the grave, that the Messiah wouldn't decay. So Paul is just giving them the Word of God, just reasoning with the Scriptures. And why? Well, my Bible says, and so does yours, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. So we share the word, that's when people get saved. Sharing our testimony, sharing the word, and people get saved. Their faith, they come to faith. Many, many churches have started to rely on other things besides the word of God. And it's unfortunate. They 
rely on their emotions, conditions, circumstances, and then some churches, they use dramas, music, and these things can be used and they can be good, but sometimes that they depend on them more than they do the Word of God. Miracles, gifts, traditions, they rely on those things more than the Word of God. One movement in the recent years, well, I say last 20 years, recent for me, was the emerging church movement that was started by this man named Brian McLaren. He used icons and traditions and things to reach people. But this man, here's what he said. Here's some things that this man said. Huge movement in the church for years. He said this, Tony Campolo and I might disagree on the details, but I think we are both trying to find an alternative to both traditional universalism and the narrow exclusive understanding of hell that unless you explicitly accept and follow Jesus, you are excluded from eternal life with God and destined for hell. Trying to find another way to heaven. Here's a man that is a leader of a church movement trying to find another, saying there's another way to get to heaven. He also said this, the church has been preoccupied with the question, what happens to your soul after you die? As if the reason Jesus could coming could be summed up with Jesus trying to get more souls to heaven than hell. He also said, I don't think we've got the gospel right yet. What does it mean to be saved? When I read the Bible, I don't see it meaning I'm going to heaven after I die. This is a man who a lot of the churches are based on his, his beliefs. Many of our Bible translations today are paraphrases. They're not literal word-for-word -word translations of the Bible paraphrasing. And a paraphrase is okay if you, if you read it as a paraphrase. And don't take it and study it as a literal transla translation. Because, you know, sometimes some of the things are easier to understand in it. But it can be dangerous also. Because some of them, it's almost like saying, God didn't get it right the first time, so we're going to tell you how it is. What God really means. Instead of what he... What he means, what he really means. Some of the newer translations. You know that the older NIV is, is a, a good translation, but the new NIV, no. The new NIV, NIV is, it's, uh, you need to be careful of that. You've got the newer NIV, the New Living Bible. They're not literal translations and also you have a, a new one of the newest translations not translations paraphrases out the message be very careful with the message here's why let me give you an example the word lord in the new in the king james version which is a word for word translation of the bible the word lord is in the king james version 7970 times in the message, it's there 71 times. It's a very important word, Lord. In the New Testament, in the King James Version, you find the Lord Jesus 118 times. In the message, you find it zero. It's not there. The man who wrote the message, paraphrased the message, his name is Gene Peter Peterson. And he, he's part of secret sensitive churches and part of a lot of the things that have been going on in the world in the last 20 years or so. Let me just give you a quote from him. The man that wrote the message, that translated it, put it out there, right? He said this. The importance of poetry and novels is that the Christian life involves the use of the imagination. After all, we are, we are dealing with the invisible, and the imagination is our training in dealing with the invisible, making connections. I don't want to do away with our theology, or, but I, our primary allies in this business are artists. Why do people spend so much time studying the Bible? How much do you need to know? We invest all this time in understanding the text which has a separate life of its own and we are being more pious and spiritual when we are doing it. Christians should be studying it less, not more. We just 
need enough to pay attention to God. I am not at all pleased with all the emphasis on Bible study as if it is some kind of special thing that Christians do. I, yeah, I'm just giving you these things. Just, just be you're aware of some of the translations and things that are out there. Not, I'm not coming down to other churches. I don't want to come down to other churches. Uh, but just for this body, I need to let you know these things, okay? Here's what the Lord says to us about His Word. 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the Word of God. Accurately handling, knowing the Word, studying the Word, spending time in the Word. That's what we should be doing, each one of us. On a daily basis, being in God's Word. So once again, the paraphrases are not the Word of God, but a paraphrase of the Word of God. So read it that way when you read them, okay? Now Paul and Silas, they preached the Word of God. That's what they shared with the people. And when they do that, it says in verse 4 of Acts chapter 17, talking about the people, And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a number of leading women. So they shared the word, they preached the word of God, and people started to follow the Lord because of that. You know, including leading women. I like that. You know, the first the first person who came to Christ in Europe was Lydia, a woman. Okay? In those days, women were second class citizens. And the gospel of Jesus Christ comes along and sets them free and gives them equality. And it is Jesus who has given equality to women in this world and still does. Galatians 3, 28, 29. Paul's book. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. There is neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. Men, we are not better than women. We are equal in God's eyes. We are the same. And we submit to one another as children of God. And Paul was not a shamanist. Women flocked to hear and accept and receive the message when he shared it. The message was, God loves me. He died for me. You see, Paul and Silas, they had that, just that simple reliance on God's word that it would do what God wants his word to do. And the word of God sets people free, all of us free. Let's not sell it short. Many churches today in the States don't bring your Bibles because it'll offend somebody. Somebody might come and they don't have the Bible to be embarrassed. So if we all don't bring them, then nobody will be embarrassed. The problem with that, you know, there's a, a huge Calvary Chapel in Washington, the state of Washington, where he went in that direction and started going into the to the uh, uh, seeker-sensitive movement and and people weren't bringing their Bibles. And next thing you know, they weren't taking their Bibles anywhere anymore. Because they didn't need them. They put the scriptures right up there so you don't need to bring it anymore. And so people got out of the habit of doing that. So he repented. Changed things back up and got back into it. Got people, bring your Bibles. So these people get saved in verse 5 of chapter 17. <clears throat> but the Jews becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed the mob and set the city in an uproar and attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. And when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities shouting, these men have upset the world, <clears throat> have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them and they are all contrary to the decrees of Caesar saying that there is another king, Jesus. They, stirring up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things, and when they had received a pledge from Jason and others, they released them. So here, here it goes, you know, Paul and Silas, they come into town, they share the gospel, you know, they want people to get saved, and, you know, they want people's sin to be forgiven, and the enemy 
comes at them. The opposition comes. The persecution comes. When they start doing the work of the Lord, there comes the enemy. Always. If you're doing the work of the Lord, the enemy is going to come. Because he doesn't like it. These guys stirred up the mob. And it's not hard to stir up mobs. It, it, those of us who watched the news over the last year can tell you that. I mean, mobs get stirred up pretty quick. You watch that in the States. I mean, the riots everywhere in this last couple of years, right? Easily. Get people all riled up. They, get, they got everybody all riled up. And, and they went in to find Paul and Silas. They couldn't find him. But who did they bring out? They brought Jason and his buddies. Brought him before the authorities. And they made him give him a pledge. Probably a guarantee that this would stop. And no longer would they be teaching these things. And it seems like it did stop. And because Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 17 and 18, which could go right along with what happened here, because they go out of town after this. He says, But we, brethren, wrote, wrote this letter to this church years later. Having been taken away from you for a short while in person, not in spirit, we're all the more meet, eager and with great desire to see your face. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. So, good possibility, you know, the enemy has his ways to try to stop the work. I mean, part of this is the pledge they made to Jason that this wouldn't happen and, and his family would be threatened to be killed. That Paul came back, so it could be something like that that happened here. And then you see in verse 10, all things, the riots are going on, the people are all worked up, and verse 10 says, The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. <coughs> Again, they had to leave at night. Let's get them out of town. Let's sneak them out. Let's get them out of here. Where the people kill them, right? But don't you just love it? They don't give up. Paul doesn't give up. He doesn't stop. They go to the next place and go straight to the synagogue and start all over. I mean, you know, in the in the, in the town before Thessalonica, Philippi, I mean, Paul, Paul gets get stoned to death one time and thrown for dead. I mean, he goes back into town. They had a willingness to continue the work of the Lord in the middle, in the midst of opposition, in the midst of persecution. They just kept on going for the Lord. It's a part of life as a Christian. If you're going to serve the Lord, you just got to keep going. Because the enemy is going to try to stop you. Remember Peter and the apostles when they were imprisoned and they were shamed and they were beaten and they were in jail and, and didn't know what was going to happen. Didn't know if they were going to die or what was going to happen. But, you know, I think Daniel and Neil or whatever they is, uh, told the Pharisees and the leaders, well, you know what, we should let them go. If this, is, this is of God, you know, it will happen. If it's not, it won't happen. It, it says this in Acts 5, 40 and 41. They took his advice. And after calling the apostles in, they flogged them. That means they whipped them. They flogged them. They whipped them. And then they released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name, the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple, from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They kept on going. They just got whipped. If I just get whipped, I'm going to go to Miss Anna and let her take care of me for a month. It kept on going. Philippians 1.29 For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. It's your privilege to suffer for Him. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? But what an honor that you would serve the Lord and have to suffer if you're serving the Lord. That really is an honor. 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2. And he wrote the letter to the Thessalonians. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you is not in vain. But after we have already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we have the boldest in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. Why? Because it's always worth it. No matter what happens in the persecution and the trials and the tribulations come, 
guess what? It's always worth it. God says he'll work it out for good, doesn't he? He'll work it out for good. Everything. The trouble, when it comes your direction, it just means you're knocking, you're, you're attacking the gates of hell. You got the enemy's attention. God's using you. And because of that, because of Paul, there were believers in Thessalonica because he went and he persevered. There were believers because he went and he endured the hardship. There are going to be believers in heaven and believers on earth because you endure the hardship, because you endure the problems and the troubles when God is using you. There will be people there because of that. That's exciting. Endure the hardship and suffering for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, here they are now in Berea. In verse 11 and 12 says of Acts 17. Therefore, many of them believed along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. Oops. Verse 11. I got that. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. So when they came to Berea and they shared the word, the people just didn't hear and believe. They got into the scriptures themselves and checked it out. Bereans, that's why when... When a pastor ever tells you, be like a Berean, what he's saying is, get in the Word and see it, if it's true yourself. Don't just listen to me. You get in and look yourself. Be a Berean. Study the Word. It's important. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And the word inspired there means this. God breathed that word. God breathed this word. People will tell you, oh man, oh man. Yeah, he penned it. But God inspired it. God breathed it through man. It's God's word. 2 Timothy 1, 20 and 21. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. There it is right there. What, what did Jesus say about His Word? Matthew 24, 25. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. That scripture always amazes me. Heaven and earth are going to pass away, but his word is not going to pass away. Wow. Well, we do know that Jesus is the word. It says in John 1, Jesus is the word. God is the word. He's not going to pass away. That's how important God's word is. God's word is the test of what is true or false, what is right or what is wrong. And you do not test the Bible by what man says. You test what man says by the Bible. Somebody says something, you go look it up in the Word yourself. But all my professors in college, are, they're so smart. I mean, look at them, you know, they have these degrees. And they say, you know, the Word is it's just a myth. And I mean, come on, a flood. Oh, come on, all that stuff. It's an old book. It's not relevant anymore. It's the most relevant book there is. As a matter of fact, it's going to be around when they're gone. It'll be around when the world is gone. It'll still be here. Very relevant. So for us, it, we don't want to go by what seems to be right or what sounds good or what feels good. We want to base it on the Word of God. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. The heart is more deceitful than all else, and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Our hearts deceive us. 
Sometimes we find ourselves doing something. How did I get here? Our heart deceived us. Made us feel like it was all right. We, can, we can lie to ourselves at times. If you're honest with yourself, you know that. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Seems right. Yeah. You know what? It seems right, doesn't it? You shall surely not die if you eat from this fruit. Why would you die? Yeah. That's, why would I die? Oh, if you eat from that fruit, you know what? You will become like God. You'll be able to help him. That seems right. Give me a bite. What did God's word say? Do not eat or you shall surely die. And what happened? They died. So what seemed right wasn't right. Go, go back to God's word. Go by the word. Stand by the word. Obey the word. God gave it to us. Jesus is the word. And by the Holy Spirit, we can read this and God can reveal to us things that no one can, people in the world cannot understand. It doesn't make you better than them. It's just when you have the Spirit of God within you, He reveals things to you. God loves us so much. He wants us to walk with Him. He wants us to obey Him. He, he wants us to get out there and share the truth with others. Follow after Him. Time in life is very short. We all know that. And all of us the other day, you know, we were running around playing out in the dirt, five, six years old, weren't we? Now we're about to be ready to get buried in the dirt. <laughs> First Corinthians 15, 58. I end with this. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Knowing that as you get out and you, and you do the things that God wants you to do, it's, it's not in vain, man. God's going to honor it. God's going to bless it. You're, and you will be rewarded in heaven for it. But it starts by surrendering our lives all 100% of our life to the Lord. Opening up all areas of our life in our hearts to the Lord and letting Him do surgery and clean house. He shed his blood. That all that stuff is forgiven. He loves us that much. And he rose from the dead to seal it. And he comes and lives in us. And he has great plans for each of our lives. He just wants to use us. And he will. If we just submit and surrender to him. Let's pray. But Lord, here we are. We know what you said to Isaiah. Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here I am. I will go. Lord, let that be our hearts. That you will send us to our neighbors, to the grocery store, to the post office, Lord, to the beach, to the restaurant. Here we are, Lord. Send us and use us wherever we are at. Even now, search our hearts, cleanse us, Lord, and fill us up fresh with your Holy Spirit. Go before us, lead us. Even today, Lord, put somebody in our path that we can share the good news with, Lord. Whether it be with words or our lives, however it comes out, Lord, just use us. And thank you, Lord. Thank you that you care for us so much, that you give us your word and your promises, and that you love us and you forgave us. And we're going to be with you forever. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Well, God bless you, man. Walk with the Lord this week. Uh, once again, if you have anything you want to donate for the clothing giveaway this week, you know, get a hold of us. And uh, we'll bless the people. God bless.